When are you going to film the new Dodge Dart? Fine. Here's a 65 Valiant. Verwenden Sie die Website, um Hallo zu sagen. Verwenden Sie die Website, um mir ein Auto zu geben. Verwenden Sie die Website, um einen Hut zu kaufen. The Falcon was Ford's cheap entry-level car in the 1960s. The Chevy too was Chevy's. And the Valiant was Chrysler's. Radio? Optional. Self-canceling turn signals? Optional. No brake booster. No shrouded fan. No radiator overflow tank. No overdrive gear. And no diagram to tell you where the gears are. Driving a three on the tree is like driving a fraternity handshake. It makes sense as long as you don't think about it. If you have to, just think about how a manual column shift is the same as a floor shift pattern turned sideways. And when you shift correctly, it feels like there's nothing there. The gear lever just falls in with no resistance. But when you fail to shift correctly, the transmission feels like it's a broken Lions Club gumball machine. Three forward gears. That's all you have to work with. First gear is unsynchronized. That means you use first for pulling away from a stop sign, and that's it. If you try to downshift from second into first, even if you're going one mile an hour, the gearbox goes Grrr. So, in driving a Valiant, it's really just a two-speed manual in practicality. Second gear for in-town and third gear for back roads and third's upper limit for the highway, which means third gear takes you from 35 miles an hour all the way on up. Even though this Valiant's rear gearing is something generous like 280 or 290, the Mopar Slant 6 still howls above 60 miles an hour, and top speed is about 70. 65 Valiant. Don't think car. Think front end loader. You trundle along at whatever the vehicle feels like going, which is either 25 miles an hour if you're in second gear or 50 miles an hour if you're in third. That's where the engine is happy. And that's how it feels like people drove in, in the 60s. You just find out at whatever speed the car likes going and you just stick to that. And you accelerate at this incredibly lethargic pace up to 25, and then you just look, 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 through town, and then, oh, you have to go a little bit faster, and oh, there we go. And if you try to go faster than 50, because you're going to have to, like driving this thing in modern traffic, it's going to go, whoa! Ugh. The 170 cubic inch Slant 6 makes 101 horsepower at 4,400 RPM and 155 pound-feet of torque at 2,400 RPM. Most of your time will be spent around 2,400. That is about those uh, 25 miles an hour and 50 miles an hour happy spot I was talking about. But the times you're at those speeds and at those RPMs, you're going to find that you're in a calm interlude between a disappointing first gear and a shameful third. Changing gears on a Valiant is like coming home with a bad report card. But no one is home yet, and no one knows. So you go get an after-school snack sit with it, and think, this is nice. No point thinking about what's going to happen, but just this moment right here with my Pop-Tarts, this second gear moment, this is okay. Right now, I'm okay. Ballpark fuel economy is around 20 miles per gallon in town, although Chris gets about mm, 28 on the highway. The typical rating we found back in the day was between 12 and 20 miles per gallon. Chris's mods are relatively sparse. Well, the whole car is relatively sparse. He added a 10-inch Barracuda clutch 
and a two inch exhaust instead of the one and a half, and a road sign for a floor pan. The rest of it is exactly how Mopar made it, which is a hell of a flex. It's like Kaz playing as Chun Li when you want to show off your thighs. Cars have a narrative value. This isn't new information, especially because you're watching RCR, but. But the question is whether the value weighs heavier on the seller or the buyer. In a general sense, a seller will let the narrative set the price because of an overwhelming sense that they know what they have, whereas the buyer will take a larger financial hit because they know the potential of what could be theirs. We imbue some cars with significance that perhaps they don't deserve. And a narrative gives a justification for why we stick our necks out for cars that give us more trouble than they're worth. Because when you fall in love with something, it stops making sense. And in the endless haystack search for meaning, we cling to the stories of vehicles we love because the layperson may not understand function, but everybody loves a good yarn. You see, this has been Chris's daily for the past 15 years. Yes, he has an old Subaru, kind of like mine, but this Valiant is a tale of automotive destiny, if you believe in that sort of thing. Chris saw this car as a kid and was intrigued by it. And by the time he grew up, he wanted a car with manual everything. He wanted it small, American, and from the 1960s. So he randomly sees this car available in his town with 83,000 original miles and an asking price of $1,400, which Chris was able to talk down to 1,003. He paid cash and then drove it from Long Island to New Orleans. Never mind that the Z bar broke almost immediately after purchasing it. It was Chris's first chance to develop mechanic skills. But sometimes a car is like a wild horse and it's going to fight you on every trip until it's tamed. In this case, the exhaust fell off, and then the temperature gauge stopped working, and then the car kept overheating. It overheated more times than you could count on every digit of the human body, including the dick. Oh, and this was the summer of 2005, so Hurricane Katrina hit, and Chris lost his house, and he had to live in this Valiant for a short time. Yet, when it was all said and done, Chris stuck with this old Plymouth. He treated it as a learning experience about not pushing a classic car beyond its capabilities and getting ahead of any problems the car might end up having. Chris has since rebuilt the cooling system. I mean, what is a cooling system on a classic car? It's two hoses and a heat exchanger. But still, you keep needing to fix those things. He's learned to perform preventative maintenance by replacing things before they have the chance to go bad like water pumps and drum brakes. But is it all worth it? To what extent was Chris the right owner for a 65 Valiant, much less one that needed this much work? The previous owner was a woman named Edna. And Edna, as it turns out, was the aunt to his sister's boyfriend. The kicker? She used to drive this car around their hometown. So there was a non-zero chance that this was the same car Chris saw in his youth the car that made him want a Plymouth Valiant in the first place. Cars have their worth increased by the stories behind them, like a doll at a yard sale, well worn by loneliness and time, a million different stories embedded in its imperfect stitching, but, but in good enough condition to tell you it was loved and maintained just well enough to be loved again. Except... This is a hunk of junk. This car is running just Plymouth Valiant, sponsored by that point in a marriage where it's just two people faking orgasms, ooing and aahing just so they can go to sleep faster. They love one another enough to go through the motions, but in their head, they're just going through tomorrow's itinerary. Plymouth Valiant, you're giving me a raging hard off. I'm sorry, I really wanted to like this car. I love the way it looks. I love how Chris painted it with a roller, 
not only that, but he started with one shade of black and then ran out of paint and just started rolling the roller into the into a different shade of black. And you can see kind of where the shades change. I mean, Chris looks like a guy who dailies a 65 Valiant that's painted primer black. But as a car, this is disappointing. It's like going to the laundromat, setting the dryer for 20 minutes, and realizing all you did was take cold and damp clothes and turn them into warm and damp clothes. Hey, honey, you got any extra quarters for the dryer? I'm heading down to the warm and damp. This car is a shitbox, but a contextual shitbox. In the 1970s, if you were rolling around in a Valiant, you were poor. You were just getting by. This car is like a Chevy HHR in 2021, or a Cavalier or a Ford Escape. The type of car whose resale value changes based on how much fuel is in the tank. I gotta poop so bad. I just gotta let it run. I'll be back. I literally have to stop this and take a dump. Down I go, and to the hallway. Ooh, choo-choo, I want to talk to Ringo Starr. Spraying water in the butt. That's what we do on Sunday. It's time for church. You ever take a dump so big you have abs again? Back in 1957, the president of Chrysler wanted to explore the compact car market, but without giving up the roominess that typically went hand in hand with full-size cars. The concept was called the Falcon until they let Henry Ford II have the name. So they renamed it the Valiant and debuted it at the British International Motor Show in 1959 as a 1960 model. In its first year, this car was its own brand. They tried to say it wasn't a Plymouth, it's a Valiant. But then by 1961, it just said Plymouth Valiant anyway, so whatever. But then in 1962, it dropped the Plymouth name again. It was just called the Valiant. But then it was right back to be calling the Plymouth Valiant in 1964 onward. Which brings us to this model, which is called the V200. Even in its own time, it wasn't exactly a world beater. Unless we're talking about its brief success it had on the racing circuit. But to domestic consumers, this was a hand-me-down cardigan. In its own time, it was the definition of economy, but without the futuristic styling that the Falcon had. It's for a divorced man who goes back to his hometown diner because he misses being called Hun. Come for the pancakes and coffee? Stay for the gum chewing. The Altoona sassback of a waitress named Ethel. Come down to Smokin' Joke Diner. Are our employees condescending or just doing a bit? We'll never tell. I don't think this is the type of car that gets to go back in time. It has to continue forward into the present. In 2021, looking at this, a real patina, this isn't fake patina, it's the real stuff. The whole car is functional, but visually weathered. It projects a Ginsbergian ancient heavily connection to the starry dynamo in the night. Car bros will spend half a year's wages to project a DGAF attitude with their Fiesta STs and WRXs. They'll do fake patina. They'll do toe loops. They'll change the wheels. They'll add wings, splitters, springs, taped Xs on the headlights. They will razor cut their bumper cover, drill in 1 8 inch holes, and then stitch it all back together with multicolored zip ties to make it look like they just came off of a track. But none of that is as legit as an oily, swaying, primer black, bent chrome bumper, road sign for a floor pan, Plymouth Valiant. When driving this car, I felt cooler than acing a test I didn't study for. I had that feeling of walking out of chem class with a 100% and all right, all right, all right by Mungo Jerry plays in my head. And I think it's that hard luck approach. The idea that it's sheer luck and owner ingenuity and quick thinking on the fly that keeps this car running. And it's that uniqueness that gets Chris, 
pummeled by the same three questions at every gas pump. Is that a Pontiac? What year is it? When are you restoring it? And then they get the and then he gets the bonus question. There are people who try to identify this car and pretend they're car people by merging all the brands together. Is that a Farge Dartera? And all that tells us is that in lieu of a narrative to explain it, people, bystanders, will invent their own. But that's part of the appeal of classic cars. Not just what they do, but what they can mean to the right person. Loving an unloved car is like a bottle that never empties. You can't put the bottle away. You can only put it down. See the thing with valiance. People ask what year it is. Will you please restore it soon? Who cares why I will not move? I'll drive, I'll drive, I'll drive. 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 Yeah.